Hey folks, we are at the very end of our final lecture um, for NC State Dendrology, looking at the Western United States and the forest types that we have there. This is admittedly a pretty ambitious and longer lecture, um, but I decided to keep it all in one lecture. And this is Mount Rainier that's shown in the background here. So before we get started, I just want to quickly review Western US geography, if you haven't looked at maps in a while. Uh, so remember, our last lecture, set of lectures focused on the Rocky Mountains um, with the lower elevation forest types and then upper elevation forest types, which are found really only in nor the Northern Rockies. And um, just a reminder, the Cascade Range is here. It's just inland in Oregon and Washington. Um, and then that, that backbone turns into the Sierra Nevada um, through California. So we'll talk about forests in the Cascades, as well as the Sierra Nevada, also the coast range right here on the California coast, and we have the northern coast range and the southern coast range. Um, and then we did talk about the Columbia River Basin um, that is up here. It's kind of in the rain shadow. And then the Great Basin, which is shown here in Nevada. So these are areas that are in the rain shadow. And so this um, list of different environmental factors should look familiar to you because this sort of guides all of our lectures on forest types in North America. So you can think about climate, temperature, and precipitation. Precipitation is shown on this map. And this is a zoomed in look at precip annual precipitation in the Western United States. So you can see that um, the forest types that we'll look at today have quite a lot more moisture than the forest types that were in the Rocky Mountains that we focused on last week, ranging from um, the driest areas, you know, probably here in um, the chaparral habitat, which we'll talk about today in kind of orange and then this light green color, and then ranging all the way up into this very dark purple. This is uh, temperate rainforests that are found up in places like that purple dot is probably right in Olympic National Park. And then we have other factors that are important as well, like the growing season, the geology and soil, the disturbance, and we'll focus on that quite a bit today um, in terms of natural as well as human disturbance. And then geography always plays a role in distributing species. The species might live in a certain place, but if it can't get there, if it can't disperse there, it may not be found there. So, there are some important considerations when we're talking about precipitation on the West Coast. And you can see this beautiful and kind of a spooky, mossy evergreen forest photo here. So most of the West Coast has a Mediterranean climate. So what do we mean by that? It means that the precipitation um, has seasonality. In fact, most of it falls not during the growing season. So from October to March, and then summers are dry. So, there's another factor with precipitation in these areas. Snowpack is a really significant source of moisture at higher elevations, and also uh, very important to communities that depend on melting snowpack as their water source. So if you live in um, any of the big cities in California or in that agricultural area, they talk about how much snowpack there is and whether there'll be drought throughout the following summer. Much of these areas don't get very hot. They're moderate temperatures throughout most of the region. Up in the north, you have very cool and dry summers. So regularly temperatures in the 50s and 60s and then mild rainy winters. So the temperature stays almost consistent year round with dry summers and, and rainy winters. In the south, Southern California certainly gets very hot and dry in the summer, depending on how far away you are from the coast. And then finally, the last, Thing I'll say about precipitation is that we saw in that map in the last slide that temperate rainforest extends all the way from northern California to coastal British Columbia. I just want to, um, you know, where we have you know really a huge amounts of rainfall, so greater than a hundred inches of annual rainfall. There is a stat or it's a place that had 12 feet of annual rainfall, which is pretty amazing to imagine. And so this precipitation really drives the forest regions that we see in these areas. So today we're going to look at quite a few forest types um, and we're gonna break them down by the mountain range that they're native to. And you'll see that there's overlap in species, right? Nobody tells species where to live, but they thrive in different places. So some species are more widespread and we'll see them in multiple forest types. 
Others are very limited to a particular place. So we'll look at the coast range first, right? Starting on the far west area, looking at coast redwoods, which are found up here in um, Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. And then a Sitka spruce western hemlock forest, another important forest type. Then we'll move slightly inland to the Cascades, and we'll see that again, you know, western hemlock is found in both the Cascades and the Coast Range. So its geography is not limited to one mountain range, but it co occurs with Douglas fir. And then we'll move into the Sierra Nevada, which, um, and again, all of these forest types, there are many, many more gradations and subtleties that you know, people who work in that area would definitely want to be able to recognize. But for our purposes, I just really want you to be familiar with some of the main forest types and what these give you a sense of what these forests look like. And hopefully you'll get a chance to travel out to these areas one day to see them yourself. The Sierra Nevada, we're going to break this down into four zones and these mimic the ones that we learned for the Rocky Mountains, although we have quite a bit more moisture and precipitation of the Sierra Nevada and thus more diversity. And then finally, we'll talk about the southern part of the California Coast Range, which has chaparral habitat. That's really important just because of the recent news with wildfires in California, um, as well as Oregon and other places out west. We'll spend some time with that. And of course, within each of these regions, the forest types vary by elevation. And so that has to do with precipitation, as well as temperatures and the ability to withstand snow. So we're going to start by walking through this amazing coast redwood forest. So we're starting in the coast range in Northern California. And these are Sequoia Sempervirens, right? Coast redwoods, just amazing, which reach amazing size, the tallest trees on earth. The other forest type we'll look at is um, Western Hemlock, which we've learned in lab and also um, Western Hemlock and Sitka Spruce, which both species we learned in lab. So I want to give you a sense of what these forests look like since we're learning species in lab. These are really beautiful areas that have high levels of moisture. You can see lots of um, mosses and also ferns in these forest types. And these photos are taken from Olympic National Park, which is really has the highest rainfall in this area and a place that I very much hope to visit one day. So a little bit about the coast range. So these are very, very wet forest types. Like I said, they're considered rainforest in the temperate zone, which is a pretty unusual um, climate type. These kinds of forests used to be far more widespread in uh, geologic times, but now they're limited to these very small areas. The Coast Ranch has 80 to 100 inches of annual precip, and there are areas along the coast that are slightly drier, but they have this intensive very dense summer fog drip, which keeps the trees growing even through those dry summers that we just talked about. And the tallest trees on earth, 350 feet. So that includes the coast redwood as the tallest tree on earth, Sequoia sempervirens. But also Sitka spruce and Douglas fir can reach some pretty amazing heights. And the Douglas fir that we'll talk about today is the Douglas fir that is native to the west. That's Pseudosuga menziesii var menziesii. Remember, um, Douglas fir in the Rockies is Pseudosuga menziesii var And so this just gives you a sense of this is a not as old uh, stand of redwoods, coast redwoods. So just looking at this map, um, this is an interesting map. It shows the coast redwood range shown in pale green. And then if you kind of mix up it, like I sometimes do, um, Sequoia sempervirens from um, from um, the giant sequoia, sequoia dendron, right? Sequoia dendron is shown in the red dots. So that is, right, it's very different. It's actually from the Sierras. So these two species don't overlap at all. But if you remember from lab, right, these have pretty small cones with these peltate scales. And um, the foliage is flat. You can actually go visit a, a coast redwood tree at the shank forest if you want to and see the foliage it's low to the ground. I haven't seen any cones on it. These trees can live a very, very long time. So 1,000 to 1,500 years old. They are very resilient trees. And so they're resilient to fire and insect damage. They have very, very thick bark, which prevents them from burning. And of course, they grow in this really wet area. So fires are not really 
a big issue in the coast range. Um, it's a very long, long fire interval. Um, the fires that they do get favor regeneration, so um, they need those cleared forests to regenerate. And the fog drip that is along the coast is what enables their great height. So that fog drip is a supplemental source of water beyond a certain height. The tree's vascular tissue can't transport water against the gravitational pull. And so fog drip is really critical for these and responsible for these trees reaching this great height. Moving on and looking at these beautiful, right, forests with these giant ferns and mosses, right? So um, Sitka spruce and western hemlock are both also found in the coast areas of the coast range and up into British Columbia and Alaska. So the map that I showed you didn't show that the coast range extends into Canada and Alaska, but it does. Again, frog source is another very important source of water. And here we have, you can see in this photo, we have closed canopy forests of Sitka spruce, Picea sicensis, and western hemlock, Suga terophila. And these forests tend to grow like in mixed stands. So they're these two species, but there are many others. Um, Douglas fir is certainly among them. And there are lots of different forest types that sort of are getting lumped into this, this particular forest type. And the biggest specimens of each of these species are found in Olympic National Park, right, where the rainfall is the highest. So they're not, not a big surprise there. And these are the component species. We have Picea sicensis, right? Sitka spruce, which you learned in lab. And its range extends all the way up into coastal Alaska, but very restricted to the coast. And then Suga heteropla has a little bit broader range. Um, it also is found in the very northern part of the Rockies. And that's a species we learned pretty early on in lab when we were learning other hemlocks. Just to look at the um, Photographs of the trees instead of just sketches. So spruce is sharp, as we remember. This is the Sitka spruce on the right here with these, you can see very pointed foliage. And then the cones have that characteristic thin papery scales that are sometimes fringed or wavy on the margins. And then Western hemlock, right? Looks like a hemlock tree. I hope that each of you at the end of the semester can look at this foliage and think, oh, it's like a hemlock tree. And um, maybe if not, the cones are helpful and these have definitely larger cones than the species we have East for Suga heteropola. And this structure is just really magnificent with these very, very large trees um, exposed to the weather. Um, definitely you can see there's a lot of variation. You've got canopy trees and then also mid-story trees, but these are very dense forests. So moving on here, we're going to move from the coast range into the Cascades. So again, just a reminder, the Cascades include, um, you know, extend into Northern California, include Mount Shasta and California, and then go up into Oregon. And that includes Mount Hood and the Columbia River Gorge, and then extends up into the North Cascades in Washington and Southern Canada. So highest peak here is Mount Rainier, 14,400 feet. And they, these, this mountain range is volcanic in origin. So the most famous example is Mount St. Helens shown here on the map, right? Which blew up in 1980. Very cool National Geographic cover. And um, these, this mountain range has a very substantial winter snowfall and snowpack. And so the, the communities that exist to the West all depend on the amount of snowpack that falls the winter beforehand. You can see that the precipitation is slightly lower than the coast range, so 60 to 100 inches annual precipitation. And these forests are very dense and tend to be significant stores of carbon and also provide significant wildlife habitat. I think it's important too, if you're a manager in this area, that the land ownership is much more public land than private, like we have in the East. And this map illustrates that. So US Forest Service owns much of the Cascades um, but there's also significant um, land holdings by tribal nations, and then also BLM here to the south, and um, state, right, state forest land. So that often dictates the management policies for those forests. So the one type of forest stand I want to talk about here in the Cascades is Douglas fir and western hemlock. 
And this would be considered the montane zone, but of course there's a lot of variation in the altitude um, here, the elevation. Um, this used to be the largest wood producing region in the United States, right? It was ahead of the Southeastern United States. And that all came to a crashing halt in the early 1990s because this is primary habitat for the Northern Spotted Owl, which is declared a federally endangered species. And so once this was identified as critical habitat for the Northern Spotted Owl, much of this forest land that was, remember, under public ownership was shut down. And so um, logging and logging industry was greatly impacted in the Pacific Northwest. Our need for fiber and wood did not diminish though. And so that added increased harvest pressure to the Southeast. So that shifted the geography of the industry pretty significantly. The key species here are Douglas fir. And again, this is Pseudosuga menziesii, var menziesii. So the West Coast species of Douglas fir. And then Western hemlock, Suga heterophylla, which we learn in lab. Uh, Thuya, we did learn a Thuya in class, but not um, Thuya plicata, which is Western red cedar. But you can see, maybe if you look at that tree on the right, you'll see, oh yeah, that looks like a Thuya. It's got that flat foliage and then the ridged bark. Just a couple of drawings here. So this looks at Suga, Suga menziesii. And actually I put var menziesii here, but that's not correct. Um, right, var menziesii is through here on the west part of the range, um, Var Glauca extends through the Rocky Mountains. And so that's an important distinction. You can see here the Pseudosuga menziesii, Var menziesii has the bracts that extend, right? Both, both varieties have that, but in this one, the, those bracts are sort of oppressed or flattened to the cone. Let me see if I have another photo of it. I don't. Um, and then the Var Glauca, those, those little bracts are reflexed and they stand out from the cones. And then Suga, Suga heterophylla, you can see its range, which we just looked at. So this habitat, right, just at first glance, the structure is different, right? It looks kind of flat, doesn't it? And so this is an example of highly vegetated chaparral habitat. And so what you're looking at here are shrubs that are sort of low and they're all about the same size. There are a few exceptions of small trees that are in here, um, but this is mostly dominated by this blue-green flattened shrubs. So this is the chaparral habitat, and this is center to a lot of the wildfires that we're seeing in California taking place this year and in recent years. So chaparral is a dense shrubland, which I think you can see on the other slide. It's shaped by a Mediterranean climate. So that means it is the species that live there are specially adapted for dry summers where they're very drought limited and then cool, wet winters. Fire is also part, a natural part of this habitat. Scientists think it's a 30 to 50 year interval, but it's catastrophic, right? That it you know, torches and burns those shrubs to the ground. Um, this habitat is shown here on this map of California in yellow. It's in the Southern part of California on the coast uh, range. It also extends on the eastern side of the Sierras. And this woodland zone has, it, you know, it looks, if you look at the, this photo, it doesn't look very diverse. But if you look, you can see that these evergreen shrubs, there's actually many, many different species. And a lot of them are in the Ericaceae, which you might remember is the heath family. So that's the only slide I have for the chaparral habitat. You can see though this um, firefighter, so this burns this very, very fire prone type habitat. So next we're gonna move into the Sierra Nevadas. And so this is a mountain range that has a lot of variation, right? 1,500 to almost 15,000 feet in Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in, continent, in the continental United States. And you can see the coniferous forest habitats shown here for California. We're gonna mostly focus on the east, on the western side of the Sierras. The eastern side is in the rain shadow. And so you get into those um, Great Basin, oops, the Great Basin um, pinion pine juniper. So should not be a surprise if you drive from the east 
you're going to see that before you crest and then go into the alpine, subalpine, and on down to the foothills. So we're going to look at four different types, forest types that are lumped by elevation. Now we've already talked about the chaparral habitat. Below that is this forest foothill woodland habitat. Then we go into montane, and we've lumped the lower and upper montane forests. Um, it is important to understand the differences, but not something we'll be able to get to in this class. And then the subalpine zone, and then we may touch briefly on alpine zone, but we did that a little bit when we did the Rockies. Um, and so to sort of separate these out, I made this little chart. So the woodland is the oak slash foothill pine type, and that's 500 to 4,000 feet, depending on whether you're in Southern California or Northern California. Submontane is ponderosa pine and California black oak, 3,000 to 5,000 feet. Then we move into the montane zone, right, which is by far the most extensive. And you can see on the other map, sometimes it's broken into lower and upper. So these are mixed coniferous forests that occur at 5,000 to 7,500 feet. And then finally, the highest um, forest type in the Sierra Nevada is the subalpine. So this is not spruce fir like you might have expected, um, but instead it is fir and pine forest. So this is 7,500 to 12,000 feet. And if you look at my description list there, there's actually no Picea in the Sierra Nevada, which is pretty interesting. So for each of these four types, we're going to talk about the structure, species composition, the important environmental drivers, the ecology, and also the threats. So looking at this, this might remind you just a little bit of that pinyon pine juniper woodland, but these are um, not so much this a mixed oak and pine site. So this is a transition between chaparral habitat and the conifer forests. So there's really not any hard stops I can put on elevation. It really depends on the latitude on how far north or south you are. But the tree canopy is closed, but the trees are not very tall. They're short and they have broad spreading crowns. And you can see like annual precipitation, 15 to 40 inches. So um, not only is it, you know, so 15 to 40 inches, once you're above 18 inches of annual precipitation, you can have closed canopy forest. However, if your rainfall doesn't fall during the summer growing season, only falls in the wintertime, your stands may be and are precipitation limited. So this woodland zone, you can see highlighted here, I have the um, Pinus sabiniana shown in red. Its range is shown in red. And this is a nice outline of the woodland zone that we're talking about here. Um, and so primary species are the foothills or gray pines. This is Pinus sabiniana with these really truly wicked cones. Um, another common name for this pine is digger pine. That's a derogative name that stems from the native indigenous tribes that used to live in the area and dug the roots of the pine for food. And so that term is really not used so much anymore. It's not, not considered a, a good word to use. So uh, we'll stick with foothills or gray pine. These pines do have very valuable seeds for humans as well as wildlife. So they have these very large cone scales, very heavily armed scales. Um, although this is not one that we're going to get to use and to learn in lab. But if you looked up at this tree and thought, oh, this looks like a little bit like pinion pine, you can see the size of the cones immediately tells you that it's and then the other species that we have here might be reminiscent to you of our live oak in the southeast. This is blue oak, Quercus douglasii. And you can see it has very elongated acorns, but they kind of look like white oaks from the cap. So moving on, this is um, the falls. We're in Yellowstone Valley here, or I'm sorry, not Yellowstone Valley, Yosemite Valley, right, in the Sierras. And so the Sierra Nevada submontane zone, right, is this transition in between the woodland, right, which has the pine and also oak, and then the coniferous montane zone. So typically, uh, it depends on elevation, it occurs at 3,000 to 5,000 feet, and it has a distinctive structure. So very closed canopy. It's a secondary growth stand, right? So that means these forests have mostly been cleared. And the forests that have grown back are, you know, pretty large forests, but they are even aged. 
But over time, you can see that um, there's small trees and shrubs that come in in the understory as some of the larger trees pop out of the canopy from wind throw. But these are pretty dark and shady forests, and so there's not a whole lot in the herbaceous layer. Um, there is a lot of standing dead wood, and so right with high levels of rainfall, um, you know these these places the wood doesn't break down very quickly at these higher elevations, and so it ends up getting retained, and this can be problematic from a wildfire perspective. So our principal species in the submontane zone are ponderosa pine, which you now know, as well as California black oak, which is Quercus kellogii. Um, and so I hope that you look at this photo of this tree standing on the hillside and see its orange bark and think to yourself, that looks like ponderosa pine, because you would be right. And as you can see, ponderosa pine has a real um, range extent. It's a video I watched that claims that ponderosa pine and not taking aspen is the most widespread tree in the United States. It is certainly found in many different habitats. Um, and then this California black oak is only found from mostly in Northern California, but it's got a spreading crown um, and these kind of white oak looking acorns. So here's another shot of Yosemite Valley, just looking magnificent. This is El Capitan. It's here, this is a place you should definitely visit if you have the chance. So moving on up in the Sierra Nevada, right, we're now in the montane zone, 5,000 to 7,500 feet elevation. This forest type is the one that is most commonly found in California, right? So most extensive forest type. Um, it does extend into Southern Oregon though. And this forest type, we learned montane zones for the Rockies. Compared to the Rockies, this is much more variable and diverse um, because it has more rainfall. So that means there's more species that can tolerate those conditions. And you can see here, and also in the previous slide, this is a closed canopy forest. So pretty deep and dark inside. And we've spent quite a bit of time talking about ponderosa pine, so I won't talk about it much again here, but it's shown here on the top. And then we have sugar pine, and maybe the first time we've included a range map for that. So Northern California into Southern Oregon, one thing I like observing about sugar pine is that the cones are so large, they're the largest cones of any kind, that when they hang off the ends of the trees, they kind of look like they're drooping and they're, they're um, maybe even candles, but they hang underneath the branches and they are very large. So I hope that can make you instantly recognize sugar pine, Pinus lambertiana. And then finally on the bottom, is um, the giant sequoia, which is a little misleading. So on this map, it's shown in red. So this is an inland species. And I hope you may have recognized it just by its sheer girth and um, you know large crown, but has self pruned over time. Um, it's truly a magnificent tree and certainly one that you should recognize. So the first time I went to the Yosemite National Park, I was riding in on the entrance bus and I was looking for giant sequoias, I knew we would see some, and I kept thinking, is that one? Because there are a lot of large trees on this bus ride in, and, but when I saw it, I knew immediately that it was, had to be the giant sequoia. So we're moving up in elevation, and again, we're in Yosemite National Park, and so you can see here some differences in the structure of this stand. So what are some of the differences that we can observe? So you can see in the background, there's some closed canopy forests, but there's also some areas of bare rock, um, some standing dead trees, quite a few of those. This is part of your becoming an ecological detective training. And then the soils are probably kind of thin and rocky because owing to all these trees and rocks that are right here on the surface and how open it is, that suggests that there's not that many resources available for pines and other trees. So this subalpine zone in the Sierra Nevada occurs at 7,500 to 12,000 feet in elevation. And that, that huge variation is based on latitude. Um, but these forests are open with widely scattered trees. There's just simply not enough resources for them to live close together. And there's not a whole lot of understory. If you're lucky you see some really nice little alpine wildflowers, but for the most part, these are you know, really poor sites, and so there's not a whole lot in the story. They also have to withstand high levels of snowfall 
right? So most of the precipitation these trees get is from snowfall that falls in the wintertime. And then finally, the last thing I'll say is we've always talked about the highest elevation forests in any geography as being spruce and fir. But in this case, uh, spruce doesn't actually come into the Sierra Nevada. So kind of an interesting quandary to ask, why not? Lots of different answers that could be. So in the subalpine zone, our principal species are red fir, Aedes magnifica. This is not one we learned in lab, but just to see where it extends in um, central and northern California. And then lodgepole pine, which you can see has an extensive range through the Rockies and then comes into the Sierra Nevada as well. So that is Suga, or I'm sorry, it's Pinus contorta. Two other species that we're not going to focus on in lab are white bark pine, which is Pinus abacalis. I have a cone from one of those from Yellowstone National Park. And then mountain hemlock in this stand can be very large or can also be small, Suga mertonesiana. So this is a hemlock, just as you were thinking, you knew all of your hemlocks, right? I tell you a new one, that's one that we haven't learned. So, um, so these Western North Carolina forests, let's talk for a little bit about threats. So these are forests that are threatened, just like many of our forests around the East with insects and disease. Um, drought is certainly a major issue, right? You can see that all of the forest types, certainly in the Southern part of the Sierras, um, might be susceptible to drought. They have low annual rainfall, which trees can't tolerate for very long. Then we have this question of wildfires, and this has only become more inflamed. See what I did there? Um, as we've gotten through um, in most recent years. And this photograph is very provocative. You can see people standing around looking kind of casual. You can see vehicles down here. So that might be your first clue that this is not a normal wildfire. Um, instead, this is actually a prescribed fire that's conducted at night to try and avoid as many, um, avoid a lot of um, potential for it getting out of hand during the day. And so this part of this is a, a, an attempt to reduce fuel loads so wildfires aren't so bad. And then we have um, climate change, which compounds all of those factors. So we have this like probably, you know, interaction with um, insects, disease, drought, and climate change that makes these forests much more susceptible to wildfires than they have been in the past. The other issue that we see that is problematic is this wildland urban interface. We have people living in these fire susceptible areas much more often and much more frequently than we have in the past. And so that also um, creates some like very real problems for people living in these areas. Um, this current fire map is something that I encourage you to link to. I'm going to click on it now just to show you. So this is the fire and avalanche, fire weather and avalanche center. And you can zoom in the pretty LA. It was really hard to find current and real time data for fires in the West, but um, you can click on these individual fires. This is a super extensive fire. Um, the August complex fire like, started two months ago. It's burned over a million acres. So, you know, there's some really pretty sobering statistics on wildfires in the West right now. So check out that fire map when you have a chance. I also linked a paper here about climate change and whether um, we'll experience more and more catastrophic wildfires as the Western United States gets warmer and drier. And I think there's a lot of evidence pointing to yes, um, but you can link to that article yourself to read it. Then I pulled this up um, from this paper, Large Wildfire Trends in the Western United States to see if there's like a geographic um, trend that we can see here. So you can see all the wildfires are recorded between 1984 and 2011. So this is actually out of date, it doesn't have anything from the last 10 years. But you can see there's trends of increasing fires, right? In almost every ecosystem and geographic area um, in the West, with the exception of basins, right? Which don't really have issues with fire. And then Mediterranean California has got a lowering trend of fire. 
So just to do a quick recap, forests in the West have plenty of precipitation, but sometimes the seasonality of precipitation affects the species that can grow there, right? So we have that Mediterranean climate um, from, you know, Northern California down to Southern California. And the Pacific Northwest, right? So up in Washington and Oregon is a temperate rainforest. We can see more than a hundred inches of rainfall annually in these places. So that's pretty notable. Um, the highest levels are in the Olympic National Park in Washington state. And then if you go south in the, um, along the West Coast, much of the Southern California area is chaparral habitat with evergreen shrubs. Um, it's very dry in this Mediterranean climate. It's very, very typical of Mediterranean climate. And similar types of habitat, also called chaparral, occur in the Mediterranean and in other places with this kind of dry summer growing season and wet winter climate. Unsurprisingly, the tallest trees on earth, the coast redwoods, grow on the coast range, um, the northern coast range in northern California, extending into Oregon. And the Sierra Nevada, right, which is inland in California, has a higher species. A lot of the, the forest types mimic the types that we saw. We, we've identified the same zones that we did in the Rockies. But um, overall, the Sierra Nevada have a higher species diversity. They do, these forests do partition along elevation zones, but it also depends on your latitude, right? So a forest type that might be found at lower elevations to the south will be found in, or I, I'm sorry, the other way around, higher elevations in the south will be found at lower elevations in the north, right? So it's all about the climate. And then finally, I'll just wrap up and say that wildfire is a really big problem in the Western United States. We've seen that recently um, in spades, this kind of wildfire impact is just compounded by insect and disease outbreaks and also climate change. So managing these forests is really, really difficult. Um, it's definitely hard to predict the long-term effects on climate change on these forests. Um, certainly there could be some management that could play into reducing the threat. So like the, some of the ponderosa pine forest restoration, clearing some of the dead wood that is on the ground that helps trigger these wildfires um, could be part of a, you know, combine that with prescribed fire could mean that, you know, that could be one way to get these wildfires, certainly the extent of them and the frequency under control. And so, you know, it's, that we're going to wrap up there. I hope you all get a chance to visit some of the amazing forests that we see on the West Coast um, and learn about them and get to know them in a little bit more detail um, than we're able to do in a single lecture in class. But I have hoped that you've enjoyed going on these virtual tours with me and um, we will wrap up there. So thanks for tuning in.